Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Positive Post in Conversation. I'm Zazie Todd, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend and colleague, Christy Benson. Hi, Christy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And today we have a very special guest, Jane Wolf. Jane is the co-owner of Good Wolf Dog Training in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and she specializes in treating separation anxiety, and she's a cert certified separation anxiety trainer. She also graduated with honors from the Academy for Dog Trainers and is certi certified through the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers as a CPDTKA. She's been working with dogs professionally since 2014, and she loves working with dogs and their people. Hi, Jane. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you very much for coming to chat with us today. Our main theme is the topic of kindness, kindness in dog training to dogs and to their people. But first of all, can you tell me, how did you get into dog training? Um, I adopted difficult dogs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The first dog I ever, I, we always had dogs growing up, but the first dog I adopted as an adult, um, I was not prepared for at all. And she was really aggressive towards people and I was way in over my head. So I hired dog trainers to help me and they were not helpful at all and actually quite rude. And so I kind of just ditched that and um, managed some things and my dog was okay, you know, uh, and then I adopted a second difficult dog. <laughs> it was even more difficult than the first. And, uh, but I adopted her from a colleague who was um, just starting out doing some training. And so I kind of just started tagging along with her, um, mostly to get help with my dog. And then pretty quickly was like, I like doing this. So um, yeah, I, I think the, the combo experience of feeling really, uh, not helped by a trainer and then also like needing so much help with my dogs I was like I just think it should be easier than this so yeah here I am <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so then you you went to study at the academy for dog trainers how did you get to there and decide you, that you wanted to specialize in separation anxiety yeah so I actually heard of the academy for dog trainers um because of Milena Martini, I had read her book. One of the many issues that my dog Nina had was separation anxiety. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to do about this. And none of the advice I'm getting is helpful. And so I read her book and I was like, what does CTC stand for? I wonder, I was, I had learned about this CPDT and was kind of headed towards that anyway. So I looked it up and then looked up what the Academy for Dog Trainers was. And then uh, on top of that, uh, Debbie Jacobs, who's a, another colleague, um, uh, I read one of her books too and saw that she's also a student in the academy. And so I was like, clearly this is where I have to go because two of, two of my like very influential people in my life have done this. And then I read a bunch of Jean's books and I was like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. So I initially, I didn't know that I wanted to just do separation anxiety. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but after my experience with uh, my dog Nina and talking to other trainers, a lot of trainers being like, Oh God, I don't want to ever do separation anxiety. That doesn't sound like fun at all to me. I was like, no, I can do this. I've done it. You know, like, um, so yeah, after I graduated, I, I did a lot of stuff right after I, I finished school. Um, and then pretty quickly was like, this is, this is what I like doing. I don't really like working with aggressive dogs. It turns out I'm like, a super big wuss <laughs> like, uh, uh, that kind of stuff like really doesn't interest me at all so um you know I uh yeah I just like I, I think the other part I, I apologize if I'm rambling a little bit about it but I initially um when I was as uh, in college I had considered going into social work and really just love humans so much and so it was like I think separation anxiety could be really good fit for me because I get to do the gratifying I'm helping you with this really massive dog issue uh, and the the I get to stare at cute dogs all day. So I got both, which was really nice. So yeah. So when you were talking about like how you had hired an earlier trainer and they, they just weren't helping and they weren't, you know, that great to work with. It sort of reminded me of like the two dog classes that I went to before I started to get into dog behavior more seriously. 
and they were both like not great one was reasonable i guess but one was literally this old guy and we were it was like the walking around in a circle with your dog on a choke and you're just like healing all day and like giving them collar pops that was like the majority of the class and he wasn't very kind to me or my dog and i went because i was having an issue with my dog and in retrospect obviously like <laughs> a behavior class wasn't what i needed to do with that dog. right right but it just and i think it kind of for a long time turned me off of the idea of dog training as a profession just because there was i think you know and we're talking about kindness and, and so that's why i think sort of my brain went down this path but he wasn't particularly kind to dogs or me and it it does i think i think that's that's kind of a missing piece maybe in like the 70s 80s 90s mm -hmm. dog training sort of method and approach that really i mean we have to be cautious and cognizant that that exists still mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay so what do you think is the most important way to show kindness to dogs, I guess, is the is our first special question for Jane. Yeah. Um, truly, like, just let them do whatever they want. <laughs> That's really how I feel. Like, <laughs> like I think, uh, you know, let dogs be dogs. Like, let them do stuff. I, I really think about, like, I might go into the weeds on this a little bit. I apologize. But I, I really feel like, uh, like, my relationship with my dog is is both like helping them fit into my world and helping myself fit into the their world a little bit if that makes any sense like that may be like way too up here a little but truly like just spoil your dogs like all you want and help them and, and obviously too the basic stuff help them feel safe you know train them humanely but i think that all kind of falls under like let's just help them have fun you know I, i've been thinking a lot lately about like to I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to go way into the weeds. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about like domesticated animals generally and what a massive responsibility we have as human beings who have done this to like, like protect them in the world in a way where I'm like, you guys, like my pit bulls, they, they need so much from me. They could not survive outside on their own, you know, especially while I'm in Michigan. So, you know, they would probably just freeze you know they they hate it if it's 70 degrees or cooler so like they're screwed out you know but I, but I do just feel this like massive responsibility to like just make their lives so awesome um and you know not to like make it real dark I guess but all of my dogs are suddenly seniors and I think I realized the other day like oh gosh like my my life with you is so short and so like let's just live it up really like I, I I don't see any reason to like like need to do anything except make their life great so yeah I don't know I, I mean I really think like let them do dog stuff more than anything you know <laughs> um, so yeah that was my very long-winded answer I apologize <laughs> well no and you described that as going off into the weeds but actually if you think about the principles of good animal welfare it includes letting dogs or whatever animal you're talking about engage in normal behaviors and so letting them have fun is one way of framing that I think because that lets them engage in the things that that they need to do and want to do so yeah. not, not I mean, the weeds like, at all <laughs> and like find joy in that too like dogs are so like I always kind of joke like dogs are kind of terrible all the time and I love that that, that I, I I really do think it's hilarious and like try to find the joy in it like dog digs Indy has dug himself a new dig pit in my yard where I don't particularly want it to be honest but it's really hilarious to like watch him you know roll around in the dirt and just be insane and like you know we're both just having so much fun while we're doing it you know we're like is it ideal for me no not really but like does it matter no not at all really you know so yeah <laughs> i think there's there's something like big to be gained or that was gained when when dog professionals started talking about you know like looking at dogs lives through their own eyes like that the the umwelt kind of conversation that started happening maybe like i don't know 10 years ago or something i think that was it was a nice turning point where people were like, instead of going, what what can we do to change dogs? To be like, what what the dog's experience of our world like as a starting point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too, like uh, like your previous experience, Christy, your training class. I 
I kind of lucked out. I went to a random training class because my dog was biting people when I was like 20. <laughs> and so I was like, she needs basic obedience. Why I like nowadays, I'm like, I would have never allowed myself with that dog into my own basic manners. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I actually ended up though with somebody who was really pretty great. Like we use treats. <coughs> I want to say she encouraged us to try using a clicker, which I was like, I don't know what this thing is. And then this was a long time ago. I mean, this was like the, uh, early aughts still. So I was like, wow, oh, it's pretty impressive. She sent me some resources because my dog tried to bite something during class. <laughs> uh, so she sent me like, uh, like told me to read, don't shoot the dog. I think she maybe recommended one of Jean's books and, you know, so I, I kind of looked at it in that sense, but the, the trainers I was hiring were like, you need to control your dog, you know, like very much under the mindset of like, it almost felt like this, this dog that I have, who I want to be my companion is more of like a, an item in my house and not like, a living, breathing creature that I interact with and form a relationship with. It seemed much more like what she should do is be in the corner and stay there. And then when you want her to do something else, you tell her what else you want to do. And I was like, she's not, it's not like a appliance in my house. You know what I mean? Like she's my buddy. You know what I mean? I don't, I just don't want that relationship with her. So I, I think for me, like really leaning into like watching her just be a dog. And of course, making her feel safe too. I mean, obviously there were some big issues that I had to address, but, um, you know, I think once I just like let her be a dog and let her kind of tell me what she wanted, things got a lot easier and she stopped biting people. You know, it was, I really didn't do any training. Honestly, I just kind of managed the world and stopped putting her in situations where she would bite people. Um, you know, kind of changed my behavior because of what she needed, you know? Um, so yeah, management for the win. <laughs> yeah, so much training. So much training is actually management. But actually, both of you have now talked about dog trainers who were not very polite to you or even were actually rude to you. And I hear a lot of people say this. I get people email me sometimes telling me the things that their dog trainers have unfortunately said to them, which are not polite and not helpful. But of course, sometimes when you're working with someone and their dog, they do have to change what they do. So Jane, what advice do you have for trainers as the best way to talk to people about the things that they do need to change that is a kind way of framing it and will help them to see why it matters? Yeah, I think um, like try to remember where you came from too. Like, I think most dog trainers, maybe not all, and that's probably changing now too, but most dog trainers have been there. Like we've all done stupid stuff with our dogs. You know, I absolutely did things to try to train my old dog, Sea Dog, that I'm not terribly proud of, you know, um, but that's what I was being told to do. And in, you know, we live in, our industry is unregulated, you know? And so when people come to you and they're doing things that you're like, oh, that is a bad idea, you know, like try to remind yourself of that, you know, and, and so really like try to lead with some compassion, you know, that like truly what they, they are trying to do their best right now and believe them that that is, that is what they are trying to do. It might be wrong, but they are literally just trying to do their best. So I, I really try to lead with like, okay, I need to help you right now. Like this is so I'm not going to judge you, I'm not going to yell at you, you know, ever. Uh, I'm going to try to like meet them where they're at. Um, and I think too, you know, there is sort of an art to myth busting, you know, like I, I'm not going to show up and be like, well, actually, because that's just, no one wants to hear that, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and I think too, if you like immediately call people out, they're immediately on the defensive and it shuts down conversation. And so I think it's really about like reframing things in a way that, um, are relevant to that person and try to explain it in a way without judgment and with compassion that like, I, I understand why you are doing X, Y, and Z, but here's what I think we should do to alleviate this issue. And, you know, and sometimes that means not necessarily correcting them too. Um, you know, like there are things that I absolutely am like, we're just not, we're just not talking about that. And that's fine. You know, it's not affecting anything. We're not going to worry about it. We've got a different plan. And to be honest with you, like, um, a lot of that I learned from Jean Donaldson too. I mean, like client counseling, that aspect of the Academy for Dog Trainers, I think was like, 
so monumentally uh, important and useful to me. So uh, yeah, that, and really like after I saw that that would be covered in the course material and stuff, I was like, yes, please take all my money. I want to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, like reframing things in ways that people can really understand and are useful and don't be judgy about it. You know, like you can reframe things for people without making them feel bad about their choices and really assure them that like you're there to help them. This is kind of a team joint effort here. You're not there to just like bully them. Um, so, yeah, I unfortunately talked to a lot of people too who were like, you know, the last dog trainer I hired yelled at me. I'm like, why would you ever yell at someone? I can't imagine doing that to somebody, but it unfortunately is very common. So, yeah. <clears throat> one of the um one of the things that I do at the academy I, I don't know if you two know this is is I grade the we have an assignment that's for client reframes like how to sort of you get a question from a client or a student in class and and you sort of have to provide as a student you have to provide how you would respond um but it is it's like it's interesting I think because one of the things that we're learning in the academy is that humans are animals too and we learn in in sort of specific ways and yes we we have to be clever and finesse things as dog trainers you know like i'm not going to pull out like a sports analogy to someone who's like me and not sporty at all <laughs> <laughs> right totally <laughs> but still just that you know there are, there are, there are good ways to approach people and not and i mean taking it sort of as an as a, a a granted that we want people to we want to be kind to the people who have hired us and we want to be kind to the people who are coming to us and saying please help me with my dog right i mean i think that's just a given um but also that there are specific ways for us to change behavior you know in in humans as well as in dogs and so bringing that together and being like there's a kind way because we're going to put kindness sort of this is what we want to do as humans to each other um you know but also there are specific formulas and ways that we can be kind that will sort of events behavior change in our clients and in their dogs so it's interesting to me that there's some science to it you know there's like there's a craft and there's skill but there's also like we can look at the science and, and sort of be like here's how we can change people's behavior i mean that's one thing i think about a lot is that like as trainer force free trainers who are like here's how to change here's how to change behavior you know that even in the force free world i don't always see people really using that knowledge with other people too and it's like you guys we we learn the same way like it's not <laughs> you know you can use these same principles and so i think about that a lot like if i'm talking to somebody what can i reinforce what do i want more of you know like wow you're doing such a good job with this say that you know like you have to try to reinforce people for that you know or like maybe yeah. we need to manage the situation a little bit better so this isn't happening anymore and i don't necessarily need to like i i think we are really like socialized with humans to scan and punish. And I, I think it's really important that, especially knowing what we know about how to change behavior, that we are applying the same principles to our human clients. The thing I try to remind myself a lot is that too, is that like my client is the person, my client is not the dog. I mean, yes, the dog is a part of it, but like ultimately that human is the per it is is not only the person paying me, but is the person that I, is the subject here, really, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I can train the dog to do stuff. You don't even necessarily need to be there for that. But like, I then need to teach that person how to maintain that and, you know, all of these types of things. So I think, um, yeah. It always breaks my heart when dog trainers are like, oh, I love the dogs, it's the people I don't like. And I'm like, oh, man, yeah. then you don't like your, then you got to, maybe get a different job you know, or like change how you feel about this you know um so i think yeah. one of the ways that we sorry zazie did no I, I was just gonna say that i think good people skills are an essential part of being a good dog trainer so yeah sorry christy go ahead no, I, was, I was just gonna say like to take the kindness conversation one step further i think it's okay to be kind to ourselves and to to as dog trainers and just be like yes we will want to punish people for doing bananas things with their dogs you know <laughs> and that's okay and even like on social media like if you know you're scrolling and you see something and you're just like my hands are just like they want to type <laughs> you know i'm like i could this is 
ah, or even people who respond to my own business page posts. Sometimes I'm just like, oh man, I could eviscerate you right now. <laughs> but <laughs> but that is that useful? No. And then I, I'm I'm not gonna like judge myself. I'm gonna be like, yeah, that's like a really normal human thing. I'm not like a bad person for wanting that, but I'm not going to go ahead and release the hounds <laughs> on <laughs> random people, you know, because it's not useful. You know, really too, like kindness is kind of a practice. Like you do have to, we are not socialized to lead with that. You know, we are socialized to, I mean, that's why it's so easy to like get on the internet and start screaming at people. That's why people do it because it it feels, uh, it's reinforcing to the punisher. We know that, you know, it, uh, it's easy, it's accessible and you don't have to necessarily be held accountable. And, And we've been socialized to do it. And we really do prop that kind of thing up frequently. You know, like if you think about what we see in media across all types of media all the time, like people get reinforced for behaving that way, you know? Um, and so I do think it is like a practice too, to be like, oh God, I really want to yell at you. <laughs> like, please don't do this. And then having to like take a step back and be like, okay, no, I have to think about this rationally. And, and I will say it, like anything else that you practice, it gets easier. You know, like I, I do think that even people I don't like or things I don't like, I can lead with some amount of empathy and kindness in all situations. You know, there's, um, this is interesting too. I, I was having a conversation recently um, in, with somebody about the difference between niceness and kindness. And I do think there's a big difference there. You can be very kind and you don't necessarily have to be super nice all the time, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like I, I think uh, you can not like something and be like, mm, no. Uh, but still lead with that kindness of like, okay, I, I know, I know better than to like lean into this base instinct to be like, shut up, you know? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I think also you can be super nice, but not kind at all, because there can be something very, very cold and angry behind that apparent yeah. niceness. So, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So one of the, cause, because you do a lot of separation anxiety or exclusively separation anxiety now. Pretty much uh, exclusively. Yeah. Right. So I think, you're coming up against a lot of, and I don't do any separation anxiety, and this is why, is because you have to sort of get across to people that they can no longer leave their dog alone. Um, and I think this would be, for me, a really hard one, to that convincing component. Um, so just like in the sort of the context of being kind to your clients, how do you approach that? So I will say it's easier than you think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would say that, now, now granted, the people that are contacting me maybe already know that I'm going to ask them to do that. I make it really obvious on my website. It's obvious in any like literature that I put out. It's a question on my contact form. So I might have a very biased sample size. Um, but I will say that most people that I talk to are either already doing it or relieved to hear that that's what I'm recommending. Like a lot of people are still leaving their dog home alone, mostly because someone told them that they should, you know what I mean? So I think most of the time I get this like, okay, good. You know? Um, and I think too, you know, I, I often, I mean, really not leaving your dog home alone is like any other type of management. Like, you know, if a dog was aggressive towards children, and they were like, yeah, and he goes to the daycare I run in my basement every day. I'd be like, oh, more of that. You know, and I think trainers generally are pretty okay with asking people to do that. But then when it comes to not leaving alone, it's like, oh my God, how on earth would I even do that? Um, so if anyone is nervous about that, don't be. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, you probably do this all the time. But usually what I'll do is just explain to people why, which is really like, we have to protect the training that you are going to do. So there's no, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to take your money if we're not doing this because it's a waste of your time. Um, and it's obviously a welfare issue too. And I usually will explain that too, that, you know, your dog's having a panic attack and, um, and people, you know, if your dog's panicking at home, they're also experiencing that either through the stress of knowing or seeing their dog having such a hard time or because they get home and their house is destroyed, you know, like, it's really upsetting to get home and see that your dog has chewed through your door, you know, like that's, yeah, man, just so heartbreaking. So, um, so I explain that piece, explain why we're doing it. 
to protect all that and to prevent this other stuff. And then I really try to, to help them figure that out. You know, like I'm there to support them. I can't work with somebody who's not doing it, but that doesn't mean that I won't, I'm not going to just ditch them. You know, like I, I, I give people ideas. I try to network. Um, you know, if there's compounding issues that are going to make that really hard to do, I try to get them help with that. So, um, uh, thankfully my wife is also a dog trainer and she does a lot of fear and aggression stuff. So I can be like, you know, let's make your dog a friend or whatever. So it really is kind of a, I see it really as sort of a team effort, you know? And, and so I, I try to like give them as much support as I possibly can. Um, and then maybe recommend some things in the meantime, you know, I, I try to really reassure people too, like, you may not be able to figure this out today and that's fine. You know, we're going to figure this out. Um, so it's really like baby steps at times, uh, depending on people's schedule. So yeah, I, I haven't run into too much of a problem with it, honestly. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Milena Martini collects some data on some of that too. And also it's, you know, most people don't give us too much pushback. Thankfully. So, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Because I like how you frame it as a team effort as well. And I think that speaks to kindness as well, because we're, be, we're all on the same team and you want to be kind to your teammates. <laughs> totally. And I mean, sometimes because I do separation anxiety, I take clients anywhere in the world. Sometimes I can be more helpful than others. But I mean, uh, sometimes this is why social media is pretty all right. You know, <laughs> it's like I can connect with other people if I need to. Uh, next week, I'm driving about two hours away to go house sit for a former client because she needs somebody so like I will physically do it if I can um and if I can't then I'll definitely find somebody and it, it definitely is a team effort you know so great and so you actually also do a lot of work in the social justice realm as well and I wondered if you could tell us something about that yeah I mean I think uh I I feel weird feeling <coughs> I do a lot of work in this realm because I I uh, I feel like there's a lot more I could be doing, but I'm trying. <laughs> and um, so uh, I primarily lately have been um, mostly doing some work with some local mutual aid groups uh, in my community, trying to, uh, you know, help build community and get people stuff that they need and get stuff that I need and, you know, kind of like really team effort this again, team effort, whole thing, you know, uh, but in life too. So uh, I do a lot of volunteering with a local group called Pet Pals Mutual Aid. And um, what we do is uh, kind of act as a sort of hub. So if people want to get rid of pet stuff, we can get it. If people need pet stuff, we will try to get it or distribute what we have. And that could be anything from food to cat litter to toys. Um, I'll offer free training or advice. Um, uh, we try to get uh, um, it's two big issues that we're trying to work with right now too is um, vet care because it's really expensive and hard to get and also shelter. Um, so um, the, the group was founded by uh, a woman who also works with the unhoused community in the area and shelters are really big deal because we have four seasons and in the summer it's super hot and in the winter it's super cold and most of the warming and cooling shelters don't allow pets. Um, and then that is a really, it puts people in a really tough situation where they, you know, they don't want to get rid of their pets, but you know, it's below freezing and snowing outside and they live in a tent, you know, so it's, it's really pretty tough. So, um, if we can, whenever we get monetary donations, we'll try to put people up in hotels. Uh, like over the summer, we had a couple, you know, like a week span here or there where the heat was out of control and it was super humid. And um, I don't know if you've ever been in a tent in the middle of the summer when it's humid, but it's like a little furnace in there. Uh, and so we would like put people up in hotels temporarily. Um, and uh, we're constantly talking about creating a pet pals palace which is basically just a open space where people can live with their animals if they need to uh that has not happened yet but we would love it to um and then the other the um the vet piece of it too 
uh, because I'm a dog trainer and because people know that I'm a dog trainer and a lot of vets refer to us, um, I'm trying to use that to get vets to offer free vet care um, or at least like free vaccine clinics and, and things like that. Um, I also do a monthly, uh, participate in a really cool monthly mutual aid fair called Pullover Prevention. And um, sometimes I'm there under my dog trainer hat, but sometimes I'm just there to fix cars, which is also super fun for me and not like dog training at all. But basically the Pullover Prevention Clinic, uh, we do minor repairs to people's cars um, so that they can avoid uh, unsafe or unwanted interactions with police. Um, so we do like headlights, taillights, you know, basic, put your bumper back on, uh, that kind of stuff. And so it's really fun. I, I quite like tinkering around on cars too. So um, it's a very, very good time. Yeah. The mutual aid fair too, they do all kinds of fun stuff. Like there'll be, um, it's, it's basically like a collection of a lot of local groups that come together to get people stuff that they need. So there's other people there doing like harm reduction stuff, passing out like safer sex kits, Narcan, things like that, car seats, uh, tents, clothing. Yeah, it's a really, really good time. Yeah, we do that monthly. Oh, there's a free food truck. Oh, it's such a good time. I love it so much. Uh, <laughs> and then I think to the other, um, this is something I'd love to do a lot more of, but also I've been thinking and talking a lot about uh, prison and police abolition and uh, trying to get my fellow dog trainers to also chat with me about this and kind of work through some of these issues. I've done some in-person uh, chats to just trying to, cause I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers. So sometimes I'm, I'm like, can we just like talk this out and try to figure out like what we wanna um, get behind? What kind of needs do we need to fill? Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, a lot of mutual aid stuff mostly. That's amazing. You're yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So Ed, how has your work like in that realm and, and in the social justice realm, how, do you think that that sort of impacted how you in, approach your clients? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, especially thinking more about prison and police abolition, you know, a big part of that world too is leading with kindness and compassion and recognizing that harm comes from unmet needs. And so I, I think it has really shifted how I view clients coming to me with issues, especially some of those issues that you're like, oh my God, why are you doing this? You know, it, it, it's probably because something, something is happening, you know, and, and uh, I think another piece of, you know, some, uh, uh, an, a, need, a need is not being met is really what I mean by something is happening. Um, and, uh, you know, when we think too about like uh, how not useful punishment can be for changing human behavior uh, in the long run and the fallout of using punishment both with people and with dogs. I think about that a lot in terms of how I deal with my clients too. You know, like if, you know, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, like if I can leave with like, hmm, my base instinct says punish this, I know that will not be helpful or could really make things worse. So how can I problem solve this in another way? You know, I, I've also been getting into some like restorative or transformative justice stuff too. So I think it's also really changed how I talk to people, you know, that like, again, I'm, we're, we're coming together to problem solve this. And so we need to try to communicate about that in a way. Um, you know, not, not that I'm like sitting down with clients and being like, here's our restorative justice ses session, you know, or anything, but I really do try to lead with like, I, I want to meet this person where they're at. I want to communicate them with them in a way that is um, equal, you know, where I'm not necessarily being like, hi, I'm the authority and just demanding that you do X, Y, and Z. This is really like you and I are coming together to do this thing. So. Um, I think it like it, it's so much more likely to stick if you're like, what, what can your life support? What makes sense to you? You know, yeah. what, what would you rather deal with first? You know, I think totally, I think if we just are like, and here's my blanket approach, <laughs> it's, it's less likely, I think for any one particular person in their particular instances and in, in life, it's, it's less likely to be useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. it, it, it also has made me really question and think more too about like, policies that are in place for dealing with animals, you know, like, um, 
whether that's uh, the way that like shelters and rescues adopt out their animals or take their animals in or the how when and why animal control is called you know these all of these kinds of things I, I do try to really think about the bigger picture and the bigger impact that some of those choices can make you know uh, can cause and then like how could I instead like uh, fill this immediate need that would prevent these other systems from like kicking off. So like uh, a good example, part of why we do, um, why Pet Pals exist is because the, uh, there is a food pantry at our local uh, humane society, but there are a lot of barriers to using that. You get put on a list where you cannot then adopt any animals. Um, you know, you can only go at certain times. There's no transportation to get there. There's no bus line. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, you know, all of these things. And then, so people don't utilize it. And it's like, well, that's not helpful. Like here, do you need dog food? I have extra here, take it, you know? And so, um, yeah, it, I, I think, yeah, the biggest thing for me really is like not scanning and punishing and really looking at it as a team effort, us, us together, um, I think it's also made me trust people more. So <laughs> like yes. I, I do like baseline, like, hey, I really trust you a lot and I like you. And so let's start from there. So I love the way that our conversation about kindness has moved on from not just being about kindness between individuals, but how structural factors and systemic issues affect things too. I think that's really important. Yeah. But we have to move on to books in a moment. So before we move on, is there anything else that you want to say, Jane, about kindness and in dog training? Um, trust people, you know, like trust, trust your clients. And I think if you lead with that, you're probably gonna lead with being more kind towards them too. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us about that. And now we're going to move on to books. So we get to have a really fun discussion about books too. I'm going to lead first with the book of the month for the Animal Book Club. And then we're going to go around everyone with our own personal picks. So first of all, the Animal Book Club this month is reading Wonder Dog. Um, this is the English version of it. So actually the North American version has a different cover, but it's very hard to get hold of in Canada. So that's why I, I, <laughs> I've got the English version. This is Wonder Dog, How the Science of Dogs Changed the Science of Life by Jules Howard. And it is an absolutely brilliant read. He's an amazing writer. It's actually brilliantly told as a story. I found it riveting. And it's the history of the science of dogs from really like from Darwin basically and it goes through things that you know about as well as including things that you don't know about and it doesn't shy away from the fact that unfortunately some of the research on dogs especially early research on dogs actually was quite unpleasant for the dogs but he handles it really well so he kind of refers to it in the text and he puts all the gruesome gory details in footnotes so you can choose whether or not you want to read about some of that stuff and it's just really interesting and along the way he highlights some of the special dogs that have contributed to this re this research um, so it's just a really interesting fascinating read and in a way it's the history of psychology as told through dogs as opposed to all the experiments that people have done on rats and mice so I think that's great and we were really lucky because he came and did a talk for the positive post and that recording is still available for anyone who signs up to my free email list and I'll put that link in the comments so anyone who who wants to listen to that webinar and watch it can find the link in the show notes and sign up and get it so that's wonder dog and it's it's this month's choice for the book club and it's just brilliant really fascinating so jane what book are you reading at the moment yeah that actually is pretty relevant because i have pitbull and um this book came out a while ago i don't remember actually when this book came out um but it talked about like the history of the, the breed pitbulls so it's actually kind of relevant and I super want to read that book that you just mentioned um 2016 is when this one came out um yeah this book was amazing I will admit fully I have pitbulls I love pitbulls they're my favorite dog ever I just think they're so cute and I love terriers and so I'm a little biased um mm -hmm. but I really like this book because it does basically go over like the history of pitbulls in our society and 
what a big deal that, that really is. So I think why this is really interesting is you do learn a lot about the, the breed and the history of the breed, kind of where they came from and how they've been seen in society throughout time and how that's changed and transformed. But it also is really interesting because of the social aspect too, of like how, um, how like our dogs and domesticated animals, like how, how we view them is also how we view the people that have them, you know, and, and, and like, so it is really very fascinating, uh, you know, in terms of like looking, kind of using dogs to look at the larger the social picture too. So um, it's an excellent book. There's definitely some tough parts to read. I have a very low tolerance for, um, uh, like any kind of animal abuse or gory stuff. So there's definitely some tough parts, but, but I do think like the overall story is so good that that kind of makes it a bit easier to, to get through. And it's not all just like dog fighting 24 seven you know, or anything. So, um, so yeah, it, it really is a fantastic book and I highly recommend it's also well-written. I just I found it to be a very good read. A lot of info, but doesn't feel like now I'm reading a wall of facts, you know? So, yeah. So that's Pitbull by Bronwyn Dickey. And I have to say, I'm really glad you chose it because I love that book too. And I think it's so well written, so fascinating yeah. and such an interesting social history as well that's of true. America, I think. Yeah. Cool. Christy, what book are you talking about today? Well, I actually have picked. Um, so I'm picking this book because um, it's Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. Yeah. And it's, um, it's actually a graphic Novel. And I, I picked it because at least one of our dogs is like we have a gate across our um, one of our bookshelves because one of our dogs was just eating books all the time. And so he somehow recently or maybe Sitka or the puppies, I'm not sure, has has learned to like reach through the holes in the gate and pull books out and they started pulling out we have we used to have like the entire collection of Alison Bechdel's she writes a comic or has written a comic since maybe like the 80s called Dykes to Watch Out For. So it's like this really important sort of canon of lesbiana <laughs> in North America. And, you know, like coming out as a, as a queer person in the 90s, it wasn't like there was, it wasn't like today where there's a lot more access to media about ourselves. So this was like a really important way to like find a community, you know? Um, so we we used to have the entire collection of all of her books, but the dogs have like one at a time. <laughs> I'm pulling them out and eating them. And it's like, I, I know I, sh I should feel bad, like, oh my God, my book collection is decreasing, but it just kind of feels like, well, I just, I don't know. It feels like, oh, well, th this has passed and now I'm gonna throw this one out. And then another one comes out a week later or something. <clears throat> but anyway, so that, the, seeing that diminishing bookshelf, <laughs> Has led me to remember this book, which I read before when it first came out. So it's a graphic novel about her life, like as a young woman growing up, her dad is it's largely about her relationship with her dad. Her dad was um, a gay man married to his mom and was also, um, what do you call it when they had a, a, a funeral home and he like um, handled the bodies. So he would create bodies that were sort of funeral worthy so she and and then he he i anyway don't listen for the next two minutes if you don't want spoilers to the book but he ends up dying and and it's sort of the question is whether or not it was a suicide and 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 so anyway it was sort of like it's like a almost like a coming of age and her dealing with the question of her dad and you know she came out to her dad and all of a sudden they had so much to talk about but she also is she's super super brilliant and knows all of this stuff about books like she's really into literature which i'm not but she's so good at writing all of these like you know like allegories to other like super literary books that that you know that she's doing it and you can appreciate the cleverness of it even if you don't know what the source material is so she's just like that good of bring you're like i bet this is this is something you know this is she's she's making a point here or she's she's using you know this literary source material to sort of shine a light on her own experience so it's it's really good it's an interesting book it's sad you know because it's talking about obviously like someone's death and then it's morbid which i love um 
but also she's you know it's just be, he passed away i think just before aids really became a huge thing and so she's like talking about that and would that have affected her mom and so anyway it was it's it's good and it's relevant and it's super easy to read because it's a graphic novel but her art is also you know right it's amazing, it's amazing. amazing. it is yeah. it, it, it tells us stories usually i don't i'm not like a comic person or an art person at all but her art adds so much to her stories so so that's my choice cool I, thank you I, go, I, go on jen i used to work at a gay and lesbian bookstore and we had like all the volumes of decks to watch out for and fun home and i would just on slow nights sit there and read <laughs> all of it all the time it's so good they really are good good okay and so the book I'm going to talk about now is Invisible Boy by Harrison Mooney that I've just finished reading um, and it is a memoir of his childhood really um, growing up as an adopted black boy in a white evangelist Christian family in Abbotsford which is kind of part of the Bible Belt close to where I live um, and as you can imagine from that framing, it's quite a difficult story. It's absolutely heart wrenching in parts. Um, he did not really know any black other black people growing up. It's a very certainly was a very still is a very white town. And so it's the story of his childhood growing up through that. Um, it's he's got a wry sense of humor, so it makes it possible to read some of these awful experiences and towards the end you get to learn how he came to meet his his biological mother um and he, he went to university and he as part of one of the classes he was taking he started to read writers like James Baldwin and so on and so it's about the development of his sense of his own identity as well and kind of leaving his past behind and I've seen him talking about it on Twitter and he says none of his family have contacted him since he wrote this book which anyway but it's I feel like it's an important read and because there are quite a lot of interracial adoptions and I grew up in a family with one um you know I have a black adopted sister our story is very very different from this but I wanted to read it because of that and it's it's a it's a really excellent read it, it's a it's a brilliant book actually so that's that and I will put all of these books in the show notes so there will be links to those there. And Jane, if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, you could always go to our website, goodwolf.com. Um, Wolf is with two Fs because that's my last name. So uh, We're also on Facebook and Instagram. Um, our social media presence is slightly low, uh, but feel free to reach out if you want to chat. And truly, if anybody is like, I want to talk about kindness or prison and police evolution and how that relates to dog training I want to so please bug me <laughs> I would love to chat so yeah cool and you yeah. take separation clients by distance so people who want someone yeah. to work with them with Seth Hanks can get in touch as well absolutely anywhere in the world if you have the internet I can help so yeah feel free Jane to just um I, I I'm not sure if I'd mentioned this earlier Zazie so I apologize but Jane just released her course on in my oh, yeah. school so she has a grooming course that's available through Christy Benson Dog Training, and, and you can read about it on my website, which is christybenson.com, um, and then sign up if you want to. So, yeah, and, and, and you will experience nothing but kindness in the course, I promise. <laughs> and cute pitbulls the whole time. So, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and truly, too, that's my other, like, real love in dog training is doing handling stuff. So um, also, if you just want to talk about that, I'd love to. So bug me. <laughs> brilliant and i'll make sure that link is in the show notes too and thank you so much jane for coming to chat with us it's been a really fun chat yeah thank you guys so much for having me i super appreciate it this is fun thank you yeah, and yeah. everybody watching if you hit the subscribe button then you'll make sure that you see all future episodes of this as well thank you very much for joining us today bye all bye